All right, good morning. Continue our study in 2 Samuel. One of the things we've been looking at in 2 Samuel is one particular bad management after another. It's not to mitigate uh, the fact that David was a man after God's own heart. We're not trying to mitigate that, but every single one of God's people had you know, some flaw, right? The ones who actually followed the Lord more closely were able to overcome those particular flaws because of the fact that the Lord was indeed guiding them in all their decisions. Uh, this is one of the strangest episodes of many strange episodes in David's life. Could you imagine after the Civil War, uh, Lincoln turning the United States Army over to Robert E. Lee? I mean, uh, that would not make sense. But that's exactly what David does. The general who was leading the army opposing him, he, turns to, he tries to turn the army over to him. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but there's a reason for that. So let's take a look here at 2 Samuel chapter 20, starting in verse 4. 20 verse 4, and says, And, and the king said to Amasa, Assemble men of Judah for me within three days, and present yourself here. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bichri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue, pursue him, lest he find himself fortified cities and escape us. And so Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out to Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. And when they were in, at the uh, large stone, which is Gibeon, Amasa <coughs> came before them. <coughs> now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. When Joab said to Amasa, Are you in, in health, uh, in good health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand uh, to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground. And he did not strike him again. Thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. And he saw that everyone <coughs> who came uh, upon him halted. And he, he was removed from the highway, and the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Wow. <laughs> um, is it any wonder that, uh, that the Lord called David a bloody man? You know, all this is happening under his watch. One of the things David had done <coughs> after he called, after the defeat of Absalom, he sent and said, Judah, why have you not brought me back to Jerusalem? And then he said, a personal note to Amasa saying, will I not make you the general over my army? And so, so he makes a promise to Amasa that if he ushered him back to Jerusalem, he'd become general. Now, this is kind of a strange thing since Amasa was leading the troops against David. 
I mean, who would do such a thing? You know, and so this is, uh, <coughs> you know, what do they say? Politics makes what? <laughs> Strange bedfellows. Because the mass had led the troops. However, since Joab was the one who won the victory, you would expect him to be honored. But Joab also had killed David's son, Absalom. So David is much more uh, against Joab for what he did than he is against Amasai for leading the troops against him. I mean, this whole thing is just very, very strange and very, very odd. Now, David's move against Joab, you know, I don't, you know, I, I know David's a man, I'm sorry, but this is actually rather spineless. Um, and if, if he has a trouble with Joab, he should do what? He should confront Joab directly, right? He said, listen, this is what you did. You disobeyed my orders. This is a, what I'm going to do in response to that. He does, but he doesn't even inform Joab that he's going to turn their army over to Massa. Apparently, he doesn't even tell him, <laughs> right? He just does it. And so, instead of coming directly to Joab and dealing with it, this is a trying of a backdoor way that he's going to try to get around this issue that he's having with Joab. So David, David merely hands over command to Amasai without a word to Joab or the army. Now David sends Amasai to gather forces to pursue Sheba. Now Sheba, you know, remember in our last exciting episode, <laughs> That there was an argument between the ten tribes of Israel and Judah, you know, you know, we have more uh, claim on David than you do. I mean, it's a very petty argument. And, uh, you, you know, and Israel says, okay, then we have no claim on David at all. Men to your tents. And Shebai, who was a Beth, who was a Benjamite, which is interesting because uh, obviously that's the tribe of King Saul, you know, Benjamin. He said, to your tents, O Israel. By the way, this is going to happen again in David's grandson's period, Rehoboam, where Jer Jeroboam leads Israel away. And so to your tents, we have no, no investment in Asia. Now, this is really an amazing thing because they just went through a rebellion. They just went through a civil war. Now we have another civil war right after this civil war. And so Amasa has three days to report back. David's, David's plan was to remove Joab on the sly, right? Just sort of, I'm just going to ignore Joab. By the way, Joab is not the type of guy you're going to be able to ignore. And he has a massive following. He said, I'm just going to sort of, like no one's going to notice, just sort of change over. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some people questioning the fact that, wait a minute, the general that led the army against us, you're going to now make him the head of the army. For one thing, wouldn't you question a mass's loyalties? <laughs> right? I mean, so th this, this, this is just a strange, strange episode. Uh, now, Amasa doesn't come back in three days. Now, the situation is kind of interesting in the fact that obviously David was not comfortable of turning the army under Joab over to Amasa because the army under Joab would be loyal to Joab. So in three days... David expected Amasa to raise an army and come back and pursue, back. this whole thing is strange, to Sheba. So she, he said, listen, if we wait any longer, Sheba is going to get into fortified cities. Then we're going to have this long, drawn-out civil war because to, to take a city, you have to surround it. You, it. It takes months to, you know, they all walled cities back then. Uh, by the way, you might be interested to know, probably already do, the reason why we don't have walled cities today basically is when the cannon was invented, walled cities no longer <laughs> would protect you. Cannonballs just sort of knock the walls down, you know. 
as Poland found out when Sweden invaded, they had these nice walled cities and the early cannons just knocked the walls down. Um, David thus had to do something. Massa has not showed back up, so who does he have to turn to? Now we're back to Joab. He still does not want to deal with Joab, so he deals with Joab's brother, uh, Abishai. But Abishai and Joab are what? They're like that. I mean, it's not like you're not going to be able to get around dealing with Joab by going to his brother Abishai, because all Abishai is going to do is turn the command back over to Joab. Are you following this? Okay. Just sort of like as the world turns or something, you know. <laughs> uh, it never, this is important to understand, it never is go good to try to solve a problem by pretending it doesn't exist or trying to go around it, you know, to avoid it. You know, it, it is a, you know, the old expression, the farmer can either plow around a stump or get rid of it. But, he, you know, you can't ignore it. It's there, right? You have to somehow deal with this thing. And so he doesn't do that. He doesn't confront the problem. By the way, it's a problem in your life. You have to confront it, right? You don't ignore it. I learned it early on in the pastorate that uh, problems within the church just don't go away. If I just ignore this, it's just, uh, you know, they're there. And the buck stops here. You know, Harry Truman, right? The buck stops here. It has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with properly. It has to be dealt with, hopefully, uh, quickly. It, the, the, the more it stretches out, the more it festers, right? If you have a problem, it has to be dealt with. And so, so the Lord was not going to allow David to shirk this responsibility. If I just sort of hand everything over to uh, Joab, or to Amasa, uh, this problem will go away. It's not going to go away. And so, so instead of, the problem's still there, unresolved. You know, Joab's not going away. <laughs> and Joab's influence is not going away. So instead of going directly to Joab, David asked the, uh, uh, Abishai, Joab's brother, to gather her troops to pursue Sheba. Now, there's no reason given why Amasa took so long, but it's likely that it's going to take more than three days to gather these forces, you know. And so uh, Amasa probably was not trying to purposely delay, right? You know, it's probably it just takes a while. Now, Joab chases Sheba to the stone of Gibeon. Apparently, there's a big rock there in Gibeon. Now, Gibeon's going to come into the next chapter because there's a drought that comes in because of what Saul did to Gibeon. But that's, that's, a, that's a sermon for another day. Amasa meets Joab in Gibeon. Now, it's not, it doesn't say here in the text, but it probably had, had his forces, heard that Joab had already in pursuit. So is going to come and join Joab in pursuit. And so he meets Joab, and Amas assumes that they're on the same side, right? I mean, we have the same goal. We're going to trace this rebellion down. We're going to trace Sheba down. We're going, we're, we're going to work here together. Joab does to Amasa the same thing he did to Abner. He, Joab feigns friendship. Are you well, brother? And then he stabs him in the stomach and kills him. Exactly the same thing he did to Abner. Joab does, Joab's a brave soldier, but he, this is cowardly. This really is. He doesn't, he doesn't confront Amasa. He doesn't, he doesn't, um, you know, explain, here's a problem I have with you, Amasa. He doesn't challenge him to personal combat. He kills him in cold-blooded murder. If you kill someone in battle, you know, that's legitimate. If you just murder someone, you know, that's murder, right? It's just cold-blooded murder. And by the way, Amasa did not appoint himself to head of the army, did he? He was appointed by David. 
So once again, Joab totally ignores, just like with Abner, totally ignores David's command. Uh, and so Joab kills him in cold blood. Uh, what Job does is he creates an execution, but he doesn't have the authority to create an execution. There's no trial here, right? There's, no, there's nothing here that indicates the fact that there is a reason to, for Joab to murder Amasa. Uh, Joab just removes another rival from the scene, you know. Now, Joab is shrewd, but he's not an honorable man. That's the problem. He, he's, he is wise in knowing what needs to be done, but he's not honorable. This guy is not honorable at all. And so, so here he comes. Joab uh, is the men rallies around both Joab and the masses forces apparently to pursue. So you have one of the men say, okay, who is for Joab and who is for David? Follow us. And so he takes the masses forces and they follow. Now, by the way, this is one of David's problems. When it comes to military power, Joab has far more influence and far more authority over the men than what David does. Even though he acts in the name of David, Joab's a legitimate threat. If Joab really had desired the kingship, it would have been a real problem for David. Okay? So Joab was personally ambitious and jealous of his position. And David does not deal with this. So part of the blame, maybe a major part of the blame, is on, on David for not dealing. By the way, we see this all the way through, right? David not dealing with things. David not dealing with Amnon. David was not dealing with Absalom. David not dealing with Joab. Over and over again, we see this. So Joab ignores David's orders uh, when it suited him. Yeah, that's what David said. So the people know in their mind who has the real authority, right? You know, there's a, there's a saying, it's not the person that sits on the throne that's the most important, it's the one who influenced the person sitting on the throne, right? It's the chief advisor that usually is the one really running the nation. So due to David, David's mishandling of justice, and seeking to impose solutions without solving problems, Joab takes matters into his own hands, and this is his third murder that we see. So you got Abner, you got Absalom, and now you have Amasa. And David does what? Doesn't do anything. Not any of these. Three murders. By the way, this, this, this applies anywhere, in your marriage or whatever. Problems need to be confronted and solved, not just talked about, you know. And so a lot of times uh, when I go into marriage counseling, there is basically the spouses defending their position. That's what happens. And quite often not even agreeing on the facts, <laughs> you know. And so as long as you're entrenched in that, you're not going to solve anything. There's nothing can be done for you if I'm going to just defend, you know, my position and what I'm, what I'm doing. And David just, instead of defending the position, he just ignores it. And so David does not deal with any of these murders. He allows Joab to do whatever he wants to do. I'll use as an example uh, in our own history... Uh, Douglas MacArthur took that on. He did whatever he wanted to do. And finally, Truman had to deal with that because MacArthur wanted to invade China. Uh, you know, at that time, a little bit less than a billion people, you know, and somehow he th thinks that he can invade China. He's going to do it on his own. <laughs> By the way, this goes all the way back to the Hoover administration where Hoover, did, I'll give you a little side history here. There was what's called a bonus army that invaded and camped in D.C. These were World War I veterans. They were told they were going to get a pension at the retirement age in 1945. 
But of course, in the middle, there's a great what? Great Depression. They need the money now. So they're marching to get their bonus now. Douglas MacArthur was in charge of the um, DC um, encampment and, and protection. Truman sent him, uh, not Truman, Hoover sent him out to clear out the camps. Well, instead of clearing out the camps, he burned their camps down. They were camped over in Anacostia. And he burned them out, chased them down. He was rather ruthless. And Hoover did what? Didn't do a thing. Didn't remove him from command. Didn't discipline him. So you fast forward, you know, decade, and a, decade and a, uh, or a couple decades later, and here MacArthur is at it again. I don't care what you say, I'm going to go into China. <laughs> and so they had a meeting, he was relieved from command. Uh, matter of fact, Truman had to get with his uh, chief of staff to make sure Omar Bradley was behind him and, and, and people like that. Exactly. It wasn't a private thing. Exactly. So David doesn't do this here. But whether you believe whether MacArthur was doing right or wrong, he was not the president of the United States. He was, he was not commander in chief. See, David is what? Commander in chief, but he doesn't act like it. <laughs> And so he doesn't deal with Joab. Joab is running off doing the things. And he's going to, we're going to see in the next book, he's going to try to have Solomon, his son, deal with Joab. Now, I think one of the things we have here is the fact that Joab's the one that knows how Uriah really died, right? That's his. If you have skeleton in the closets, they have power over you, right? That's why we have to keep our accounts open and clean and clear. No one has something over top of you. And so, and by the way, that, that's the same in marriage too. If there's something needs to be said, something that you don't want to uncover, deal with it. Don't keep it hidden. Okay, Joab's cold-blooded calculation stained Israel. Joab a true believer? Only the Lord knows that, right? But it surely doesn't seem like the actions that you'd expect of someone who is honoring the Lord. The Lord knows. We're going to see Joab in heaven? I don't know. Uh, but we do know Joab did what he wanted to do. Insubordination in any organization, a church or a country, cannot be allowed to continue. One of the things we see today, which I thought back in the 60s and 70s, we saw the 60s generation, which is wild and everything. I said, well, this is a passing thing. It wasn't. Those people are now in charge, and the lawlessness is spreading. And they're releasing murderers at a fast rate, faster than they can fill out the paperwork to put it before the courts. And that's what the scriptures say, right? In the end times, men will be lawless, Second Timothy chapter 3. And this lawlessness will be infectious throughout the generations. One of the things we find over in Isaiah 520 is, Woe unto the man who calls good evil and evil good. And they're calling good evil today and evil good. And so we see this in a microcosm here in David. We see it in our own nation. In many ways, Joab is running the nation. And in many ways in our country, the lawless are running our nation. The corrupt things. And then, then claiming they're the ones in favor of democracy. They're not. <laughs> and so whenever you see this type of lawlessness, you'll not only you'll see chaos, but you see wickedness advance in leaps and bounds. And so 
we have Joab, we have David, the, the interaction between the two is not a good one. Matter of fact, David's trying to ignore this issue. But in the same aspect or the same results, uh, God is superintending the whole thing, but we have a divided nation here. And the Lord says a, a divided kingdom, what? Cannot stand. And that's exactly what happens to Israel and Judah when they eventually split. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll have a discussion. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here. And Lord, as we come to our discussion time, we, we want to learn from these things. We understand that David is a man after your own heart, but we also understand he made some very poor choices, some very poor decisions. And the scriptures promise us that whatever we so that's what we're going to reap, and that's exactly what we see in David's life. Lord, just guide our discussion, and Lord, may we just honor you and please you in all things through Jesus Christ. Amen.